Okay. So, um, good news. We're ready to go. Uh, thank you very much for your patience. Uh, good evening. Welcome to the August 29th Village Board Work Session. This meeting is now called to order. We'll begin with the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, thank you to everyone who is here with us in person this evening, um, as well as folks following uh, along on the video later on. Everything okay, Tom? I s okay, we're good. Um, uh, we're in a, a location that we're not usually in, and we're doing our best to have the best quality of audio and visual available uh, for folks who are not able to be here with us this evening, as well as for everyone in the room. Um, it's a relatively short agenda. But uh, that meaning that there's not a lot of writing on the page uh, for the agenda, but um, it is uh, both items are related to housing, and the one that has probably brought mo most of you here is the results of the vacancy study. Before we get into that, I just want to open the floor to any of my colleagues who may have announcements. I just have one that I Please. just remembered. Good evening. So um, this Saturday, the star of Bethlehem Baptist Church has partnered up with the Austin School District, and they'll be having their Back to School Bash. Um, it's going to be at Austin High School from 12 noon to 3 p.m. There's going to be events and food and giveaways. So if you're a family and a student in Austin, I encourage you to stop by. That's 12 to 3 p.m. at Austin High School. Special thanks to um, Star Bethlehem Baptist Church and the school district for partnering up and really making sure that our students have what they need for back to school. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Um, then I just will um, uh, remind everyone that next week, September 5th, we will be back at the courthouse on Spring Street, and we will be having the public hearing um, regarding the vacancy study that we are going to be discussing and exploring tonight. So anybody who would like to comment publicly on the vacancy study, um, please join us. Uh, the public hearing is scheduled to uh, begin at or as close to 7.30 in the evening at the courthouse next week, September 5th. So, Madam Manager, would you like to kick us off? Yes, thank you very much. I'd like to introduce our guests uh, for tonight that are up here at the dais. Uh, we have y Yvette Schiffman. Yvette um, responded to our RFP uh, to provide the services for the village, and um, she was the one that won the bid, and we've been very happy to work with her. And I'm going to butcher your name. I'm so sorry. It's Aisha. Aisha. Aisha, so Aisha was also one of her team members. Uh, they've been working diligently. You'll see the results of their study. Uh, we also have uh, Charles Let Lesnick here, and he is from DHCR. DHCR is the agency that will um, take care of ETPA regulations should the board choose to make that decision. Um, and so we have invited him here to share some information with our board that we thought would be also very valuable for all of you to hear. Um, so without further ado, and I do apologize for the technical glitch this morning or this evening, um, I'm going to turn it over to Yvette and uh, we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. So. We're ready. Um, uh, as Deborah said, I'm Yvette Schiffman, and my colleague Aisha Yonder is here today. We are from uh, an organization called the Collective for Community, Culture, and Environment. And we are a women owned consulting company that does work uh, primarily in New York City, but sometimes outside, as in Ossining. And we've also just completed a uh, 
study in Stanford, uh, a planning and zoning analysis for Stanford, Connecticut. Um, we, I, I actually, I think I'm going a little bit out of order of the slides, but I thought it, that it was best to, to talk a little bit about us before uh, we started. So the collective is about five years old. We have uh, 21 members who are active uh, members of the uh, uh, organization and eight people that are affiliated with us who sometimes uh, get called on to do some work on some of our projects and, and whatever. But we're basically involved in planning, uh, design, and zoning and, and related fields. And for this uh, particular project, we also used a sub-consultant, a group called SAVI for short, Spatial Analysis and Visualization Initiative, which is part of uh, Pratt Institute's uh, planning department, uh, Pratt Institute in, in Brooklyn, with which many of our members have had some affiliation, either on the faculty or, like myself, a graduate of the planning department there. And we also used several graduate students to help us do some of the field work associated with the project. So that's who we are and how we got here. And I must say that we're very pleased to have been part of this, uh, of this effort. Uh, again, as Debbie mentioned, uh, the village issued an RFP, I think back in March, to which we responded and were selected. Um, we signed a contract in mid-May. And after some initial meetings, started to uh, work on, on the project. The purpose of the RFP was to find a consultant to determine the vacancy rate in buildings that were completed prior to January 1st, 1974, and that have at least six dwelling units uh, within the village of Ossining. And for the uh, study, we used the United States Census Bureau's definition of a vacancy rate. And as you can see, it's the number of available vacant units divided by the total number of units. Um, and units considered available are available to be actually rented at the time of the survey. And it does not include for that purpose any units that are being renovated uh, for the purpose of being re-rented. Okay, next. So, uh, we had some initial meetings, as I said, with Stuart and Debbie and, and a couple of, and the Section 8 person in the, in the village, uh, and, and were given then a list of buildings that are within the category that I, that I explained. And we got a digitized list from the tax assessor's office, which our sub-consultant Savvy uh, used to do a map just to help us familiarize ourselves with where those buildings are located. And then we also used that um, to set up our field visits so we could group the buildings appropriately. Basically, we used uh, several means of trying to get information from the owners and managers of these properties. Telephone surveys, uh, we thought were going to be a primary uh, source of information. We had some difficulty getting, tracking down some of the phone numbers and then decided maybe we'd better mail the owners since we did have the addresses for all of the owners. So we did a certified mail survey, you know, with a letter uh, introducing the project and asked people to respond. This was at the middle of, of June and we asked people to respond by July 1st. Uh, otherwise, we said we would count their buildings as having zero vacancy. And that's a standard method that has been used in, in other such studies. We also decided to visit every building in the, uh, 
you know, in the category, in the category of uh, those built before 1974 and, and six units. Sometimes people just go and try and visit a building if they don't have other information. But while we were gathering phone information and waiting for the mail surveys, we also decided to uh, use our labor uh, to go out, as I said, and, and survey each and every uh, one of the properties. We looked at whether there were uh, you know, whether there were mailboxes, doorbells, uh, meters, things that indicated the property was, or air conditioners or the like, things that would indicate that the units were being lived in and utilized. And also, where possible, we talked to a building super, you know, neighbors, tenants, or whomever, to ask them about the, uh, you know, the vacancies within their buildings. So we found actually that almost 80% of the owners and managers on the initial tax assessors list did provide information either by phone or by mail or in, in some a few cases we used only on-site uh, information to, uh, to reach our conclusions. About 20% of the owners did not respond and we um, if we found that that they didn't respond we checked our on-site surveys and were then counting uh, those properties as having zero vacancy if we there were two instances that we excluded uh, properties from the study. One was a property that was being sold and the person whom we reached had said they had no information about the property. We in fact found it to be uh, you know vacant but it was being transferred to another owner and we excluded that one. And there was one property for which we had no contact information, no phone number, the, our ma certified mail was returned, and our site observations in that one didn't give us anything conclusive, so we excluded that. Also, the original list uh, from the tax assessor's office had a number of cooperatives uh, on them, and we, uh, based on what the uh, ETPA, Emergency Tenant Protection Act, says the cooperatives uh, should not be included as part of uh, a vacancy uh, study. Also, some of the initial phone calls to those properties resulted in people telling us that they had no rental. So we decided that they really did not belong in the study, and they, uh, they were taken out. Um, in several instances, we found some discrepancies in the number of units, for example, that the tax assessor had for a property. The tax assessor might have had eight units, and the owner said, well, I only have six or seven, so what to do? Um, we spoke with Stuart about that, and were given uh, a contact at the buildings department, and we checked again with the buildings department what their records showed for those properties and I think in almost every instance the building department and tax assessors information were the same and so we went with the tax assessors data in in doing our calculation but we did note in the report uh, that there were discrepancies that the owners um, mentioned and again, um, I think I mentioned before, if there were units that were under construction or renovation, we did not um, count them in the study. And we confirmed where we saw on site that there seemed to be trucks, uh, construction vehicles, and, and the like. We went back and double-checked again with uh, the owner or manager to confirm uh, that in fact some of the buildings were, some of the units were being um, repaired and not available at that moment. So what did we find? Um, first, this slide just gives you a summary with actual numbers based on some of the uh, 
qualifications that I just ran through. So the total number of parcels and units that we had from the tax assessors list you can see as 71 parcels and 1,821 units. We exempted, as I said, five parcels uh, within, in the cooperatives. We excluded two parcels of 12 units where the building was being sold or we had absolutely no uh, contact with the owner. And we excluded 21 units uh, that were being repaired. The parcels and the other units in, in those buildings were, in fact, counted. So that brings us to a grand total of 64 parcels with 1,503 units. Um, so that's the universe that we were dealing with. And one of the things we, we did was not just try to look at the overall well, I should say first, I'm sorry, that we did do a, a building vacancy rate for each of the buildings and then a total vacancy rate for all of the properties, which you can see in the uh, corner there at 3.06%. But we also thought it might be interesting because there's a variety of housing types within the community and within this class of properties that we were looking at to see if there were big differences between smaller buildings and the larger ones. So we broke out the 6 to 10 unit parcels, 11 to 17 units, and 18 and above. And we just did that as arbitrary uh, categories for the numbers. And you can see there that um, while the 6 to 10 unit buildings, there were many of them. They don't total that many units. And conversely, the 18 and plus uh, unit parcels were fewer parcels, but obviously many more units in them. Um, so we did that analysis, and then you can see in the next to the last column the number of vacant units that were associated with each of those building size properties, and then the rate calculated, again, by, by each category and the total of 3.6. 3.06, I'm sorry, as, um, as our overall rate. And this is just another way of looking at the information. Uh, we looked, again, in the, in the categories of buildings that we chose to look at, the number of units that had less than 5% vacancy versus those that had 5% or more. Um, and in the 18 and more unit properties, we had just under 800 units where there was a less than 5% vacancy, 95 uh, in the 11 to 17 category, and 232 with less than 5% vacancy in the 6 to 10 unit buildings. And then one more slice of the same information, we looked at those um, figures on a percentage basis. And in the, for the 18 and more unit parcels, about 72% of the units uh, had a less than 5% vacancy rate. For the 11 to 17 unit properties, about 60% had a less than 5%, and in the smaller properties, the 6 to 10 units, it was a little more than 80%. So again, this is just another way of looking at the, um, looking at the data. And again, you have the overall, um, the overall vacancy rates by each group. So almost, almost done, and of course this doesn't project, but um, our sub-consultant, Savvy, did plot for us those properties with less than 5% and above 5%. So the, the darker red are the uh, less than five, zero and less than 5% vacancies, the lighter reddish colors uh, 
were those that were above. But again, I wish that it was a little easier to see, but it just shows the distribution uh, throughout the village, you know, of those, of those properties. And then last but not least, we took one more look and on the distribution of where the properties are, we asked Savvy to look at uh, median household income figures, which uh, were obtained from the uh, census, and just to superimpose that on where the uh, buildings with the with the various vacancy rates were, and without giving you lots of numbers, I, th I think it's fair to say that the majority of the buildings within the sort of central part of the village had um, vacancies lower than 5%, and the most of those buildings fell uh, in areas where the median household income was between Thirty and sixty thousand uh, dollars per year, again based on the on the census. So there you have it. Um, essentially, uh, as I said several times, we found a three point zero six percent vacancy rate, and uh, based on the five percent vacancy rate cutoff, which is what the ETPA calls for, it seems to us that there are many properties that are eligible to be looked at uh, in terms of whether there is or is not a housing emergency uh, in the village. And that is, of course, not something that, that we will do, but it remains for the village to s determine what to do with this analysis, but we hope that this has been of some use. Thank you. Okay. Questions? Thank you very much. Um, that information was obviously in the report, which mm -hmm. is, I want to make sure everybody's aware, is available on the Village website. In fact, on the, the home page, you can see there's a little link that says housing studies, and you go right into there, and it, and it, it tells you the title of, of this study. So if you'd like to review any of those, um, that, ana that data, and, and it's also broken down into a variety of different um, uh, ways of reporting it uh, and considering it based on size and, and ordered differently so that uh, it can help you uh, internalize and make sense of the, of the, uh, the numbers there. Um, uh, but Debbie, I know that we had invited uh, the public last week to send any questions uh, that they may have, and we've obviously been hearing questions from folks um, in the weeks and months leading up to this. So there, are there questions that you've been getting from anyone in the community that we want to make sure that are, are highlighted here tonight? We have um, received um, four or five uh, questions mostly from property owners who were looking at their own property on the report and had questions as to how they came up with the numbers. Um, and uh, we, I believe we've been sending those to you. And so we'll be responding to those individual owners uh, directly. Um, it could have been a various uh, number of reasons why they think the, the information is incorrect. Um, but when we looked at the items that came forward to us, if we were to change the data according to what they were saying, it wasn't going to change the number. And so uh, we will respond directly to those, but there isn't a general um, question that came up that There's anyone not. was okay. looking for. Um, th there are a couple of things that I just want to make sure are clear, and, and my colleagues may have comments and questions that they want to ask as well, but I just want folks to know that um, uh, the 
it was acknowledged at the beginning of the presentation um, that our consultants have communicated with uh, both Corporation Counsel Kahan and Manager McDonnell, as well as uh, Marilyn Geraldo, who is, uh, runs our Section 8 office. Um, tonight is the first night that I believe any of us as elected officials have had an opportunity to meet with Ms. Schiffman and um, Ms. Yonder. So thank you very much. And um, uh, a big part of that is uh, regardless of what any of our opinions are about uh, what we were hoping the vacancy study would be, we're, we really were hoping that it would be done very well and that it would be done accurately, um, regardless of our opinion on ETPA. And uh, we've all, been, I think everybody in the room at least, knows uh, some of us uh, are eager to enable ETPA and some of us are not. Um, but all of us want village government to, um, to handle the analysis um, as accurately as possible. So um, thank you very much for working so hard to do this very thoroughly. Um, and I also wanted to ask you, Stuart, um, I know it's come up before um, uh, in our discussions about this process. Uh, it was referenced that the letter that was sent to landlords said if they did not respond, it would be assumed they have a 0% vacancy. Correct. And there were a number of landlords who didn't respond. I believe all of them had um, buildings with uh, fewer than 18 units. Um, and also, I believe that even if, uh, even if you removed those from the analysis, it still would have been below 5%. So it didn't actually change the data. But um, that the reason why that is allowed to be done is based on case law. Is that what I recall you explaining to us in the past? Well, that that cases approach? Have, cases have looked at that approach. But effectively, that would really be the most reasonable way of dealing with it. Because if, you, if, if, if a landlord has not responded, uh, you don't want to give him suddenly a 100% vacancy rate. So they were, they, you basically put it as zero, uh, that is if there's no vacancy in that particular building. Uh, and that, that was, you know, uh, uh, something that we had discussed with the folks from CCCE at the very early stage to do that, uh, because it was, it was realized that that really was the only way to, to have it on, on, on an even playing field, basically, in terms of doing that, because otherwise you'd just be picking a number. So the landlords were clearly told uh, you need to respond. If not, it's going to be viewed as a zero. That's also why they went back on a number of occasions and visited every single building to confirm what, you know, or get information. I, I, the other mathematical way to handle it would have been to just take those buildings out of the calculation. But if you do that, it doesn't matter. It's still below 5%. Right. I just want to point that out to people who didn't, you know, if you didn't go through all of the numbers and if that was one of the questions you had, it's one of the questions I had is, is how, how good a job did we do in being able to get responses and on the instances where we didn't, did it make a difference? And it, it, statistically, it did not make a difference. I want folks to, if your brain works the same way mine does, that was the answer to that question. Um, so anybody else have comments and questions while we're here with our consultants? Please. Sure. Um, thank you very much. Um, I, I was uh, uh, pleased with the methodology uh, of the study. And, uh, and one clarification um, for you, Stuart. Uh, my understanding is that letters were sent by the village uh, as, as like an introductory introduction to uh, the collective and, the, and that they were going to be reaching out to them to do the... There were letters sent out uh, by, my, by me to all of the different buildings. Uh, one as an identification letter for the folks from CCEE who would go there, but also for me to all the building unit owners to say, we're doing this study, you know, please cooperate. So letters were both sent from my end as well as from the, uh, from, from the uh, study's end. Yeah, again, thank you for your, for your work. Um, it was a, a very enlightening uh, report, especially the, uh, the overlay of the, uh, the economics in terms of uh, what people are making and and where the uh, you know where there's the the lower vacancy rate. So I thought that was an interesting uh, perspective. Um, you know I, I'm I'm satisfied with the uh, the study as presented. Any further questions and comments? No comments. Oh yes, please. I, I mean, it's the first time we're meeting you, so uh, welcome. Have you? Uh, been tossing before, before the study? Yeah. Well, no. No? We watch the films. <laughs> <laughs> Do we look the same live? <laughs> the, uh, and the reason I ask you is when did you do this study, this type of study last in Westchester? We haven't actually done a, this kind of study before. 
ever in any community or just here in Westchester? The gentleman in the back can't hear. You, you can't hear the, me? Yeah, can we bring the microphone a little closer when you're speaking? Mm -hmm. you Sorry. Go. Thank you. Sorry. No, we have not. Couldn't hear me or couldn't hear them? Both. Oh. So uh, what I was saying is welcoming to them to Ossining. And um, so let me repeat the question. So you've not been here before. When was the last time you've done this study in Westchester? Was your answer never? We have not done, our organization uh, has not done a housing vacancy study of this sort prior to this. Oh, so not just in Westchester, anywhere. Correct. Okay. Um, I know there were two, two, two organizations that answered the RFP, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Three. Oh, there were three. Didn't we get three? Two. 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 Okay. two. I thought it was two, but okay. <laughs> it's been a while. Um, the co -op, so this is just for my own clarification and for people, I think, that are listening into this. Um, I'm actually taking it back. So they've never done this study ever before, this type of study. Okay. Um, you excluded cooperatives because they're not a part of the ETPA structure, or what was the reason? I just, not that it changes the numbers. Mm -hmm. I think the mayor is right. I'm just interested in what you did and who you are since never met you before. So, and I think the public would be interested. So the cooperative discussion, can you just sort of clarify for me? Well, I went back and looked at the legislation and there mm -hmm. is a section that speaks about cooperatives not being, um, included they don't have rental units. In my own experience uh, in New York City, where I worked for the mm -hmm. housing and planning, sorry, not housing, housing preservation and development uh, agency, and I did a lot of work with cooperatives. Um, but wh there we have many buildings that were not built initially as cooperatives, but uh, were converted to cooperatives right. at a certain point in time. In those instances um, when there is a cooperative conversion for a family that does not choose to be a part of the cooperative they are under rent stabilization but as far as I understand buildings that are cooperatives and cooperatives alone without rental units do not come under the uh, uh, the ETPA and that was my understanding of it. Yeah, and and also, uh, the other thing, I'm sorry. Can we, can please, we Ms. Yonder, can we get the microphone closer yeah. to you? We Thank you. We called the, all of the offices and we talked to people from the yes. management companies and they told us that they have no rental units. Mm -hmm. So that was another reason mm -hmm. that we, uh, you know. Gonna, I, I just want to understand in Westchester what the deal is. Right, so, so in Westchester and in Nassau and Rockland, we are under ETPA, which is very similar to rent stabilization in New York City. And the same rules basically apply. So again, if you have a co-op and there are some existing tenants who are renting from before it became a co-op, they would be covered. But your assertion is that none of these co-ops have those pre-existing rentals. Uh, and similarly, if you had a co-op whose bylaws allowed tenants to sublet, those tenants would have ETPA rights. Mm -hmm. uh, so in all likelihood, the owners of the co-ops will have to register with ETPA, but will be deemed to be exempt. However, should in the future a rental arise within one of those existing co-ops, they would be covered by ETPA. And I just want to, I'm not sure if we introduced you. Oh, we did. We did say Chuck Lesnick from, from uh, New York State, uh, the Department of um, uh, Home and Community Renewal. Uh, please, Ricky, you have more questions? No, and the Section 8 uh, um, units were also excluded or included in all of this? Uh, you said you met with Marilyn. Just, so. I think Stuart had said, suggested amongst other folks that we might want to speak with her just to get some background on the housing situation in, uh, in Ossining. And we also looked at the uh, consultant study that you had done a year or so ago, again, to familiarize ourselves with the conditions uh, in, the, in the village. And uh, essentially what we learned from the meeting with uh, Ms. Geraldo was that it was difficult 
uh, to find a lot of owners, particularly in the larger buildings, who were willing to take Section 8 uh, tenants. Um, and that, in general, it was difficult to find apartments for these folks. And my, the, the main takeaway I had from the conversation with her was that a lot of times people are finding, a, once you get a voucher for, for Section 8 uh, assistance, they are finding apartments in other parts of Westchester or in Connecticut. That the main message was that it was very difficult for people to find, uh, you know, find housing once they had the voucher. So that contributed to the general sense of uh, not a great deal of vacancies within the, uh, you know, within this village. So it was basically for background and. Um, I would. I think that a, a number of properties where Section 8 folks live were probably included in in our study, but we didn't do anything to identify them in any way. So you didn't exclude or include no, them? No, no. Just it's other just apartments with, that you were exactly. Yeah. And that's why, because I, I saw that you spoke to her, I was wondering where it all well, it was fit just, in. It was just a kind of I a got background. It. It's for background information. That's, that was all. I was going to ask you a bunch of questions about the relative stance to other studies that you've done in Westchester and where we stand, but sort of can't do any of that since there is no relative stance at all in the study, and therefore the people that were involved in the study have no experience in doing this sort of study since it's your organization and you don't have any experience in doing this except for this one study. Mm -hmm. Would that be a fair statement? We have not done those, you know, that, this kind of study. Okay. However, we are all trained architects, planners, um, you know, landscape, ar landscape architects. Well, you wouldn't have gone the RFP uh, if you weren't um, qualified. That wasn't really the point. There's a questions of relative to other places so that I would but, be able to yeah. actually get information from you mm -hmm. relative to other communities yeah. of yeah. our size and municipalities and the people that you used and their knowledge and their abilities, not whether you're smart or not or mm -hmm. you know how to do research or not, that, yeah, well, would, that would not be, you wouldn't have gotten, you wouldn't have gotten this position if you, if you were. But the ability to ask you questions about the knowledge that you have relative to other communities, because we don't have a border in our community. We're a part of a larger county and larger socioeconomic structures. And so I'm f sort of just interested from a, as a matter of discourse as to a relative stance to the community is just as informational. So won't ask you no. anything about it no, since we, you can't just, answer it. Yeah, <laughs> you might be that. able to answer sure. a little bit better, but um, okay. I, I appreciate uh, the time that you took and I'm sure that, you know, um, that it was probably a, a very interesting study to have gone through at this point. Um, and I appreciate and your time. And we're familiar certainly yeah. with uh, as I said before, I worked for the New York City Housing Agency, and sorry, and um, the New York City conducts a housing vacancy study every, I forget, uh, three I years think, or whatever. Yeah, and so, I'm sure you know, they I'm do. Very, <laughs> so I'm familiar with colleagues being involved in those kinds of activities, and of course have read them. And and again, as professionals, we are aware of what that kind of study is, although we had not ourselves undertaken that kind of research, so. Thank you. I'd like to just follow up on a couple of the questions that, that Rika raised, and Chuck, you may be able to help us. It, it, it's probably not that surprising that you haven't encountered a lot of opportunities to do a housing vacancy study, um, because, uh, and, and Chuck, you can speak to this. Um, Croton is the other community that in the last 30 years or so has enabled ETPA, uh, I assume they went through a similar housing um, vacancy analysis that we've just done, and they would have done that whatever it was eight years ago, 10 years ago when they did it. Um, but aside from that, most of the communities that would have done their housing vacancy analysis would have done it back in the 70s and the 80s, and, and it stands to reason that the consultants that did it at that time may not still be responding to RFPs to do it today. So <laughs> that may be why there's not a lot of comparison. Now, now is, is there any light you can shed on? I, I, I believe that ETPA is also possible, um, or there are a couple of other counties, maybe Nassau and Rockland, that could also have ETPA. Are there any communities in those counties that have enabled ETPA since the 70s or 80s when this first became? No, so uh, you're absolutely correct. Uh, most of the communities that entered, entered after 1984 when they consolidated ETPA 
and the state started running it. Prior to that, it was run ad hoc by different municipalities throughout the state. Even though ETPA was actually implemented in 1974, ETPA stands for the Emergency Tenant Protection Act of 1974. And at that time, there was a big discussion as to whether uh, ETPA would discourage future um, investment in the city of New York. And there was a lot of divestment from the city of New York. Uh, so as a compromise, they said, okay, it'll only apply to things that are built now. So things that were built prior to 1974 are in ETPA. After 1974, they're not, except if they were built pursuant to some sort of government subsidy where the owners voluntarily entered into a regulatory agreement to use rent regulation, in which case uh, sometimes we regulate them and sometimes they are regulated by other entities. But yes, there are buildings that are new that voluntarily choose to join ETPA. I was looking through the files the other day in the office because the hard copies are still there. And in some cases, municipalities were you know, very informal. They would have the police chief go out and check on the four buildings that were relevant and report back, or um, their own planning department would do it in-house. In other cases, uh, there were uh, consultants. I believe you had a consultant, CHI, last year that did a, a study not as extensive as this, uh, but there is a very small group, and <laughs> you may be the only one right now, of people who currently do these studies. Um, I, I'd, li I'd just like to clarify for folks the uh, this, the buildings that you were talking about that have um, that are exempt from this. Uh, we have a couple of instances where it is um, a special situation. We have uh, Snowden House and we have Maple House. They're not included in this because it's entirely affordable units. It's a different program. I don't know if um, if you or, or Stuart want to speak to that. Are there other buildings I'm not thinking of that might also have been exempt? because of those circumstances? We, well, just to be clear, the assessor's list does not exempt, did not exempt anybody. I mean, our thought was that we did not want to be in the situation of exempting buildings. That's a state determination once the emergency is declared. So we used all, we, we the, so most of the buildings that are, that are in there, and there may be a few that were not included, but we used solely off of the, uh, uh, off of the list that was provided by the assessor, and that was the list that was all units prior to 1174 uh, completion. So we didn't, you know, deal with, you know, the there are numerous, and Chuck knows this within the statute, numerous exemptions to that. We didn't strike anybody as an exemption because uh, we didn't think that, that would be a, the appropriate thing to do. Uh, we, uh, but uh, uh, we just used the list that was provided to us by the uh, the, the town assessor. Then I guess Snowden House and Maple House were built after 1974 because they're not on here. Okay. Um, then can we just clarify one other thing when it comes to the Section 8 units? Uh, Section 8 units, there's no such thing as a particular unit that right. is Section 8. It's just a source of income for a particular tenant, so it wouldn't be relevant. Whoever lives in the apartment, the apartment itself is either a part of the ETPA program or not. Whether Correct. your income comes from Section 8, Social Security, salary, uh, child support, it doesn't matter. We, we, we don't, um, source of income is irrelevant to whether or not it's uh, considered the unit you're living in as part of this program. Unless there's some, some other reason to exempt the unit, the Section 8 status does not exempt the unit. Thank you. So just to clarify that, yeah. so there are buildings, maybe not in Austin, that are project-based Section 8, and in that case, just like a municipal housing authority building, which again, you don't have in Austin, uh, they would be exempt. Um, but if it's a voucher, uh, the mayor is 100% correct. It's a source of income. Okay. Further questions, clarifications, comments? Can I ask a question? Yeah, please. So I, I just have a clarification question. Um, that'll help us when and if uh, ETPA is implemented. So there appears to be 71 parcels, but 58 parcels that were not exempt. I'm curious how many unique owners are there? Like for instance, 1516 James Street LLC seems to own a couple of properties. IFCA seems to own a couple of properties. Uh, and I'm sure some of the um, LLCs that are created here are single purpose LLCs that once you pierce the corporate veil are really owned by the same entities. So from an implementation point of view, how many distinct owners are there? Um, uh, we into the mic, into the mic. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. We looked at the 
addresses. And if the address, the name was different, but the address was the same, we assumed it's the same person. So when we mailed the letters, we uh, wrote to them and put the name of the firm and address, firm and address, uh, firm and address, uh, asking them if they could respond to how many vacancies they had in those <coughs> units. So uh, it was, uh, actually, it's not too many. Uh, there's a couple, there's the interface which has a couple. Uh, Je uh, Jefferson Houses, I think they had a couple. And, uh, and then also Conte Realty or uh, some. So there were three or four that had several. A lot of the smaller units were seemed to be individual property owners. And, uh, and I don't know about the uh, cooperatives. We didn't go too much into depth well, with they them would, by because definition, we kind be of just stopped. Correct. But the others, uh, yeah, I can count that no, for you if you actually, want. We, just we didn't actually count that. But I'm sure you have copious notes so that if the program is implemented, it will be easy for us in the state to register. And con we'll have to contact those owners again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, you've kept all the contact information, yeah, right? The information Good. Is there, yeah. And the contact information yeah. was very hard, actually. It's not always uh, easy to find. Chuck, can I ask you a question while you're here? Um, going back to the co-ops, uh, I, my parents lived in an apartment in the 1970s. And it just so happens that we moved up to Westchester in 1974. Uh, they, I'm sorry, they lived in, an, in a rental apartment. They moved here in 1974 when their building was going co-op. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me why that might have happened in 1974 in New York City? Is it relevant to what, did we see a lot of things going co-op in 1974? And is that something for us to be cognizant of at this time if we enable ETPA and Austin? So a lot, of, a lot of buildings in New York City did go co-op uh, when ETPA uh, or rent stabilization was put into place. Uh, certainly in places like Yonkers and Mount Vernon where the bulk of the uh, ETPA units are, uh, there would probably be twice as many had buildings not gone co-op. Um, but there were other factors in the 70s and 80s that led to people going to co-ops too. So I, I don't think it's fair to say that all the buildings that went co-op went because of ETPA, but certainly if you read the literature, the presence of ETPA was one reason why uh, some owners said, well, let's just go co-op and, you know, because we can't make as much money as we'd like to make. Chuck, uh, can you just speak about uh, next steps? Yeah. And by the way, just because they're co-op doesn't mean they're not affordable because co-ops in Westchester are probably, as a home ownership option, one of the more affordable options in Westchester. So a, a next step would be that you're having the public hearing on the 5th, uh, and then you're either going to close the public hearing or you're not going to close the public hearing. But at some point, the public hearing will close, and then uh, you'll either vote to enact ETPA or you will vote not to enact ETPA. Uh, if you vote not to enact ETPA, that's it for me. Uh, if you vote to enact ETPA, um, presumably you'll pick some sort of um, effective date. Uh, and, you know, on the one hand, you want the date as close to possible now so that owners don't take advantage by raising rents. On the other hand, it will take us some time to get organized uh, because we will have to reach out to all of the owners to make sure that they register. Now, ETPA is not just about uh, fixing the prices, the, uh, the the rent guidelines board every year in Westchester County meets, and uh, this year the rent increase that starts effective October 1st is 2% for a one-year lease and 3% for a two-year lease. It was less in the year prior, uh, and it, it has varied from being double zeros to being as high as four or five percent. So uh, it's hard to predict what that will be in the future. Um, having said that, assuming you're not going to implement the program before October 1st, you're probably looking at a rent increase of two and three percent. Now, um, some tenants have leases that have terms. So they would be covered under those leases until their lease 
runs out. So if a lease runs out in January or March or April, uh, they don't get a new lease until their lease runs out. Uh, now, you're not, the, the owners are not starting with 1974 or 1984 prices. Whatever the market rent today is, is the market rent that they will establish as their base rent. And there is a process uh, for the tenants challenging the base rent. Um, and again, ET, um, uh, HCR is a quasi-judicial agency. We have 350 people in Jamaica, Queens that mostly regulate this. We only have five or six people in Westchester in that office. But a lot of the cases are handled uh, in um, Queens. We'll probably send up a representative or two to Ossining so that we can make it convenient for the owners to register. Um, and then the tenants, that piece sort of comes after the owners register because until the owners register, we don't know what buildings exist. But again, I don't know if you have any municipal space uh, where we could put a desk and put a representative from HCR. Um, but the discussions that I've had with HCR staff is that we should be prepared to locate in Ossining and make it as easy as possible for tenants and landlord to register and get information. We probably need some sort of dedicated computer hookup so we could get into our HUD system. But we would pay for all that, but we would need the rent-free space in one of your, your buildings. Um, so that's basically the, the next steps in terms of implementation. Chuck, can I yes, say, yes. do I understand that for the tenants, for the tenants who do not have leases, who, ha who do not have written leases at the current time, I know ETPA, you have one or two year leases. Is that one of the things that the, or that the state works with to actually start getting written leases for these folks? Yes, so, so one of the things that's required is that the tenants have to be offered uh, a one year lease and a two year lease. Uh, and, and, and when the rent guidelines board passes the uh, increase this year it was 2% for a one-year lease, 3% for a, a two-year lease. So yes, that's required. There are also service complaints. Um, now usually what happens is if a tenant is not, reserving, not receiving something that's the base level of services, uh, they can file a service complaint um, and then HCR goes through a process. Sometimes it could take as long as a year because the owner has to be noticed, they have to be noticed back, it goes back and forth, they may send out inspectors, they may work with your inspectors to make sure that they're getting the services that they're entitled to that are provided. Uh, it's a little difficult when you're starting sort of from scratch, but I mean some of the service complaints uh, the other day I was dealing with one where, you know, a building had a, a security guard and then they cut off the security guard. and the tenants signed a bunch of them made a petition to say this is a service complaint we used to get a security guard now we don't have a security guard so we should have a reduction in rent now usually what happens with the reduction in rent is you go back to what the last increase was before the increase so here there'd be some other process because we're dealing with a base rent and everybody sort of knew it at the game um, the owners would be entitled to MCI's major capital improvements um, now let me just preface one thing when I'm speaking I'm speaking about the current rent regulations the current regu rent regulations expire every three or four years and they're due to expire in June of 2019 depending on what the makeup of the state Senate is after the November elections there they might move a little bit more pro tenant than they currently are. So when I'm answering questions, I'm asking, answering questions based on what currently exists. What currently exists is the, tenant, the, the landlords can apply for an MCI and then it was major capital improvement where if they're making improvements to the building, they can um, put down what the expense is and they can amortize it over 60 months, uh, which is the useful life of the, of the item and that dollar amount divided by the number of tenants in the building is an increase. You know, maybe it's a $500,000 boiler or something, well, that's an expensive boiler, a $50,000 boiler, and it's divided by, you know, 43, it's going to be like a $12 a month increase, something like that. Um, again, one of the bones of contention is whether that should disappear at the end of the, the depreciation or not, and the legislature in, New York, in Albany will handle that, not here in Austin. Um, what else? 
Oh, so the, the other reason why things would be exempt, I think that was that came up. Um, one of them would be substantial rehab. So, um, and this is something I know IFCA was very concerned about. And um, let me just read you from the email that I got because it was quite complicated. The reason why some of this stuff is complicated is, um, number one, the legislature changes its complexion every so often. and. They change the rules every so often. And then there are court cases that change things. Um, OK. Uh, building has been substantially rehabilitated within the meeting of ETPA and is exempt um, if the following criteria have been met. At least 75% of building-wide and individual housing accommodations have been replaced. Number one, it's, oh, it's, it's conjunctive, not disjunctive. All three must apply. Uh, a rehabilitation must have been commenced in a building that was in a substantial or seriously deteriorated condition. And again, there are definitions about that, including if there is 80% vacancy, it's deemed to be dilapidated. And three, all building systems must comply with all applicable building codes and requirements, and the owner must submit copies of the building certificate of occupancy. And the rules are actually spelled out in this fact sheet, um, but the, the essence of it is that if you're doing a substantial rehab on a building that was built after 1974, it's considered as if the building was built after 1974, and then ETPA would not apply to you. Now, there's a second factor that I, I talked to Karen about, and that is the not-for-profit uh, use. And again, um, there are three types of decisions um, regarding not-for-profit. Um, and I wrote this down because I knew I'd be asked this question. Okay. The early cases uh, talked about ETPA from a not-for-profit being clearly charitable, and a charitable exemption, it's clear and unambiguous, and uh, there would be no uh, reason to have ETPA if it was an exempt use. So if your mission is to provide low-income housing to people, that's a charitable purpose. And if you're doing that, you don't have to be covered by ETPA. Uh, then there were some court cases that said, however, if there's a government subsidy that comes with rent stabilization, you are. And that's what I mentioned earlier about how you could voluntarily enter into a rent regulation agreement. And then lastly, um, there are some cases that have come out uh, about mitigating the exclusive language in sections 6 and 10 of section 5 of ETPA uh, about the predominant usage have to be for charitable purposes even though there are some ancillary uses not consistent with the corporate mission and that would be a situation where you might have a commercial storefront in a building that's otherwise used for rental so that isn't part of the charitable mission but it's paying for the operating costs and, and there it's it's somewhat ambiguous so basically I think the IFCA situation, A, would be covered because uh, of substantial rehab, and B, uh, would be covered because of the charitable mission. And again, uh, the, the, the real concern is not what's there now, it's going forward for future IFCA purchases. Did you get your Okay. I, um could you go back and, and just, uh, when you talk about a substantial rehab, and make sure I understand you were saying mm -hmm. there are three factors to consider. Yes. They must all be, they must. All have been met. All have been met. And one of them was an 80% vacancy no, no. rate? So the, the condition number two is the rehabilitation must have been commenced in a building that was in substantial or seriously deteriorated condition. One of the criteria for getting there is if you have an 80% vacancy rate. There are other ways to get to substantial. Uh, so basically it says, um, to the extent that the building was vacant of residential tenants when the rehabilitation was completed, that constitutes ev evidence that it was in such a condition. Um, space converted from non-residential use to residential isn't required to have been in substantial or seriously deteriorated condition. Uh, so again, if you're doing a substantial rehab, a gut rehab, 75% of the building-wide, you know, you're putting in new windows, new floors, new walls, new um, boiler, new, that, that's substantial rehab. That's just not a modification. So that would make that building considered new, something that was built post-74, and that would mean it would be exempt from ETPA. If a building was not eligible before 1974 because it didn't have enough units, 
and then something um, they it expanded or they changed the use of the space and then it was eligible after 1974 um, and it is now and it's on our list now uh, would that qualify would that be exempt would there be uh, considered a substantial rehab if there was a change of use because it sounds like that's not the case so we're talking about two different scenarios one would be a building that has converted after 74 but before today Correct. and then we're talking about buildings from the time you implement ETPA going forward okay. um, but in either case um, it might be a gray area which would mean that HCR would have to investigate and look at the facts of that case to determine whether or not it was a substantial rehab so, okay. it, it, but again, if, the, if, if a building goes from having five units to going seven units and there wasn't a substantial rehab, then it would indeed now be covered by ETPA. Okay. Did you just lean forward to comment? It, you know, HCR by and large is a reactive organization so that, you know, with 900,000 units in New York City and 35 to 40,000 units in Westchester, Rockland, and, and Nassau, uh, we don't have the staff to go out and proactively find buildings um, that aren't complying. Uh, we did establish, the governor established, I think in 2011, something called the Tenant Protection Unit, which does proactively do that. But for the most part, they're going after the big buildings in hot markets like Williamsburg, Brooklyn, uh, where people are buying properties for values that are so far in excess to what you could expect to get a rate of return given the rent roll that's regulated that we know that the owners are going to try to get rid of the tenants to jack the rents really up. Uh, I have not seen TPU uh, actively engaged in the suburbs uh, much at all. Most of their activity is in New York City. So again, it may be that five years from now some tenant comes forward and says, hey, I'm living in a building that has seven units and I think it was built before 1974 and it's not on this list. And then we would investigate that and we would try to figure out whether you missed something or whether the tenant missed something. Uh, you guys seem to have done a pretty exhaustive study and this municipality is small enough that I doubt you missed anything. Further questions, comments? I just, I don't know if it's for you, Stuart, or, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know if it's for you, Stuart, or Chuck. So in the question about next steps, one of the steps, um, so Crone has one building, and other municipalities have different, there is a way to look at ETPA that isn't all or nothing, right? There is class of buildings, sizes of buildings, neighborhoods of buildings are in, could be buildings from 12 units to 32 units, you know, that are red. I mean, it really is up to legislation. So, so that should be part of the next steps. But you didn't mention that as the next step. So you can't discriminate against buildings that are red. Um, you can on number. You can say, uh, and in fact, in Croton, they originally said it was 50 units or above. They had one building that had 100 and some odd units. They're now actively looking at whether to go to 10 units or above or six units or above. And I've gone up to Croton a couple of times recently, and quite frankly, there's one building that has 37, one building that has seven, and two buildings that have six. It's a really small universe there. And um, you know, they've, they've brought all four landlords into the room, and we've, we've hashed it out. And, and based on what they decide, uh, they'll have to do another vacancy study. It'll be a much shorter vacancy study um, to just look at those additional buildings. Um, but that's it. You can't say, you know, the north part of Ossining is going to be an ETPA and the downtown's not going to be an ETPA. It has to be village-wide. Uh, you know, the town may decide they want to do it in the town of Ossining, and that's up to them to, to cover whatever buildings are in the town that aren't in the village, uh, but you can't distinguish within the village, other than by the number of units. That's the, the only category, it's just yeah. by number. And you can't say, we're just going to do buildings that were built after 1990. 74 is the cutoff. And That's no, a statewide that cutoff. Part. I just yeah. didn't understand the elasticity of, <laughs> I didn't understand the elasticity of, and I mean, I was being cute, but yeah. you know, 
where the elasticity is. It's not necessarily an all or nothing. And the, the only all or nothing that isn't, right. uh, yeah. Oh, the other thing I forgot to mention, which you may or may not want to do at the same time you enter into ETPA, is scree and DRI. Now, SCREE is the senior citizen rent increase exemption, and DRI is the disabled rent increase exemption. And in both cases, they provide that if you're 62 or above, that's senior, or disabled, and you're paying more than a third of your income in rent, when the Rent Guidelines Board passes an increase, you do not have to pay that increase. However, so that the landlord is not held harmed because he or she may happen to have a lot of people in that category or may not, um, the village subsidizes that. And it's generally done by a tax abatement uh, to the owner. So let's say, for instance, a woman is paying $800 a month for a studio and it goes up a, a point and a half to 820, that $20 a month times 12, $240 would be what she saves during the year. And when that owner gets his tax bill for $10,000, he can subtract the $240 from that when he sends in what he, what he pays. So that is a, a direct subsidy from the, um, the, from the village. Um, again, in year one, it might be $240. In year two, it may be another $300. In year four, it may be another $400. It's going to grow each year as the senior lives in the apartment. Uh, you know, at a certain point, seniors either move or die, and new seniors move in and become seniors. So, you know, in the best of circumstances, um, in West Westchester and Rockland, usually between 1 and 2 percent of all ETP residents qualify for SCREE and DRI. So if you're talking 1,500 units here, you're talking uh, 15 units to 25 units, not a whole lot. Uh, in New York City, where they promote the heck out of this program and the city really actively wants people to participate, 10% uh, of the people participate in SCREE and DRI. I have not seen a level above 2% anywhere in Westchester, Rockland, or Putnam. And the elasticity there is that while the state requires you have to be paying a third of your income or rent, um, you can set the income limit to any number you want under $50,000 fifty thousand or under. So uh, Yonkers, Hastings, a few other places have 50. Some communities have 40. Some communities have 29 because that's what it used to be before they changed it. Some communities have 16.5. I think one still is left at 16.5, uh, but they only have one person in they really don't want to do the program. But, uh, but that's something you might want to uh, adopt at the same time you adopt ETPA, just so that it's there. Or you could have me back, and we can do it afterwards. I just want to encourage all those that are watching and that are here today, whether you're a tenant or a landlord, um, the village produced a frequently asked questions about the program a couple months ago. And um, that really goes into um, the crux of the program. Um, <clears throat> on the state website, you could actually get fact sheets that go into detail about um, whether it's a senior program, whether it's um, the um, rehab, whether it's how, to, how an exemption is done. Um, they're pretty detailed, and they're all there. Um, so I encourage everyone to do that. Um, I just want to make sure that um, everyone, it's been discussed for such a long time. This is the second time that it's come to the board. So education-wise, I think we're pretty educated whether they're for or against it. Um, so we, we definitely have the information um, to move forward, whether it's pro, you know, for or against. But I want to make sure that the public um, you know, does use our frequently asked questions on our website and on the state site as well. They're pretty resourceful. They go into a lot of detail. And as you see, um, and I'm pretty sure a lot of you have learned tonight, um, the program offers a lot more than just what we thought it did. So the state website is nyshcr.org, O-R-G. Uh, we're an org, not a com, because HFA is part of us. Uh, and then you go to rental, uh, uh, rent administration, and there's a section for tenants. There's a section, I think it says for renters, uh, there's a section for owners. Uh, but all these fact sheets are there. There are advisory opinions that are there. And uh, the, the general practice at HCR is not to reinvent the wheel. So if somebody's written it already, we don't have to rewrite it. I don't think I've written one since I've been there for four and a half years. <laughs> so 
Debbie, when we do the budgets, how, or, or I guess Chuck, so how do other municipalities budget for what, I mean a subsidy in New York City, most of their taxes are owners, developers, and corporations. Um, from the study that Dworkin did, most of, almost all, is collected from the revenue that we have to budget for, is done through homeowners, mostly single family. I mean, the condos pay a little bit, there's some little corporate stuff. So what's the process for budgeting? Because subsidy is a nice word, but essentially what you're saying is that the savings of one group of people is being passed on, not about the landlords now, but it's being passed on to the members, the other members of the community, which are homeowners. So is that become a part of a budgeting? Not only the cost of this, which I don't think is a lot, but the cost to um, the revenue stream, I mean, our costs go up every year, right? So, so, so there are three things that to answer. Number one is the subsidy that I referenced is just for Scree and Dree. So again, if you're talking about 15 to 20 uh, potential people that will use it and again in year one it's not all going to happen at the same right. time because generally you apply for Scree and DRE when you get your um, uh, lease. So because until you get your lease we don't know what your rent's going to be so we know what your income is going to be but not what your rent is. So once you have your lease and you know what your income is you apply and that's something we handle out of our White Plains office. So you know again in year one if you're lucky there'll be three or four people that'll take advantage of it and then as it goes up, you know, maybe it'll be ten, twenty thousand dollars in year ten when you're down the line a bit. But again, it's a very targeted subsidy to people who are income eligible. You know, again, if the income was thirty six thousand dollars a year, a third of that income is twelve thousand dollars a year, that means you're paying a thousand dollars a month rent and you're making less than thirty six thousand and you can see how it might be needed. Uh, in terms of the fee to participate in ETPA, uh, there's a $10 per unit fee that we collect from the municipality, but the municipality is allowed to charge the landlords that $10. So that's a pass-through. So there's no real budgeting impact on that fee. Uh, and that fee hasn't changed since 1970, I think 84. 84 is when we consolidated it. So it's a bargain. <laughs> that fee on their tax bill so exactly. that we can collect it when we collect their tax. Yeah. And then the other question, which is sort of buried in what you asked, and, and, and I've seen studies both ways, is whether the property values will go down because of ETPA. And, you know, again, um, one can assume that if the landlord used to be able to charge higher rents and is now charging less than higher rents, then from an assessment point of view, his profitability is lower. On the other hand, um, ETPA buildings tend to be in better condition, so maybe they're assessed at a higher rate. I think there was that Columbia study, study that showed that there was no effect. There have probably been studies, on the other hand, that have shown, you, you may have experience with this in the city, is you know, whether or not the property values of ETPA buildings are less than if they weren't regulated, and how that affects the assessment that the town collects. I don't think they did. Yeah. <laughs> speak to that. Yeah. And I think the um, the issue is not so much about that piece of it. The issue is the shifting of dollars from one group of people to another because somebody has to pay for everything. And um, I don't think it's a bargain, by the way. So I don't because I don't think it's about ten dollars. It's about all the other fees that go on there. Um, and the shifting of money of an increase in the rents that will not be occurring um, hasn't actually been studied. So it's not just about the value of the asset, it's the value of the revenues and what that does as you amortize it. That's the cost to another huge segment of our society. And you know, I was looking at a study today done by another consulting group about uh, Down County. The aging population is actually quite significant. Um, highly educated because it's baby boomers, unlike what it was in the 1980s. What they did in the 1970s and 80s is people went and ran, and I mean ran, to turn all their rentals into co-ops, thus eliminating huge numbers of um, off the rental rolls. And, because, and they did that in Austin as well when you talk to politicians who were in office um, a number of years ago. Um, the cost is a shift of who pays for what. The rest of it 
is an economic model, but the shifting from one individual that can barely afford to live here to another individual who can barely afford to live here and who pays for what is the cost, is the human cost involved. And I'm concerned with human cost, not just of the developers. The argument about um, it's the landlords and the tenants misses the point that it's the tenants, the landlord, and the third party is who pays for everything. And so I don't think it's an issue between tenants and landlords. It's an issue of tenants, landlords, and everybody else in the village. Because we don't have corporations, unlike Yonkers and New Rochelle that's expanded. And we don't have high income housing to the extent that New Rochelle has placed in. Listen, I mean, the wise closing in White Plains, it's causing real problems for tenants who can't afford anything. Those people have been living in subsidized by the Y who are out of luck right now, right? And there's a whole bunch of how do you deal with that and who pays for all those people, right? And what is government? In the city, it's a very different story. Um, I didn't mean to go after you for your intelligence level or your experience or anything. I just do get concerned about people who do something for the first time. It's something that, for me, is very important um, and not being able to do a comparison. So I apologize if I came off a little strong, but it, I was surprised, actually. Um, and I do think it's, there's a higher cost to it. Um, and, and that's why I'm asking a lot of questions about it. And I was asking a village manager of how we budget because I think we have a very high number of aging in place. I think we have an exceedingly not high number of people that sold houses and um, downsizing from other communities and also moving in here whose incomes will be low, whose assets might be high. We simply don't know the answer to that because nobody ever seems to ask that question. Um, but um, that is something that's happening throughout this county. I mean, there are studies being done right now about um, the people over 50 mm -hmm. and where they are. Um, asset uh, rich and uh, income poor, actually, right? So I'm not sure about your analysis. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just not sure about it. So I'm just saying that I just don't know we, about we have it. not broken 2% in any municipality. And there are, I think, 19 in Westchester and another dozen or so in Nassau and two in Rockland um, on Square Dre. You know, as much as we try to, to do it. Um, so, and again, some communities like Yonkers try to promote it actively. Other communities don't want to let anybody know that they have it unless they know it. But again, New York City at 10% is the most you'll, you'll get. And 1% to 2% is what you're realistically going to get. Thank you. Uh, okay. I'm not seeing anyone with more comments or questions. So thank you very much, Ms. Schiffman, Ms. Yonder, and, and uh, Mr. Lesnick for coming and uh, enlightening us and, and giving us an opportunity to better understand the analysis that you did. And I'll just remind everyone that the report um, that was sub submitted by um, our consultants is on the Village website under Housing Studies, right on the home page. Click through there and you'll see that it's, it's uh, one of the, uh, the studies that's listed there. Um, and will we be able to provide folks with the uh, PowerPoint that was presented will, tonight? but Jamie will be back on Friday and so it'll be posted okay. on Friday. Great. Okay. So the, uh, the actual uh, PowerPoint that we saw today will be up in the coming days and, and this video, of course, is going to be available in the, by the end of the week as well. Is there any, any final um, comments from our consultants or from um, Chuck that you would like to share with us, any, something that wasn't covered that you think need, needs to be clarified? No, just thank you for the opportunity to work on this project. And thank you. Thank you for your, your attention to the detail and, and your thoroughness. Chuck, any further final comments? I'm, I'm just impressed by the level of rigorous study that the board has done. and. and uh, not only this and, and your whole study on affordable housing, which I've actually shared with some of the other municipalities, because like you've said, there are other ways to get affordable housing than just ETPA. Um, and this is one uh, arrow in the quiver, but there are many arrows. Thank you very much for acknowledging. And then you're referencing our housing needs assessment. We are very pleased to be one of, one of the few communities in the area who has done a really in-depth housing needs assessment that is also listed under our housing studies that you can take a look at at the village. And the, uh, the FAQs that Trustee Herrera was referencing that were put up by the village are actually lifted right from the housing needs assessment. So um, you can take a look. The whole, that whole report's only about 24, 25 pages, and it's really quite readable. Um, uh, so. Uh, I know we have one more item. I think we're going to take just a two-minute break before we go into that, and, uh, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about the updated version of Local Law 3.
Uh, and we're back. Thank you, thank you everyone uh, for sticking with us. And um, uh, I believe we have an update to our conversation regarding proposed local law three, which is an update to the affordable housing policy. Corporation Council Kahan, what do you got? Thank you, Mayor. Um, good evening, everybody. Good evening, audience. <laughs> uh, when, we, when we last discussed uh, Local Law 3, or proposed Local Law 3, on uh, July the 25th, uh, the discussions included and based upon uh, what, what I got from the board was, again, for uh, 51 or greater units, it would be a 20% set aside of the 50% AMI. From 6 to 50 units, it would be a 10% set aside at a 50% AMI. Uh, uh, Twenty percent of all new construction should be three bedrooms or more, uh, and that would be. And then the same percentages would follow for uh, the affordable units. Uh, there was a discussion about the authorization for the board of trustees to waive certain bulk requirements, uh, depending. Parking, I think, was left open. It was something that I will now be discussing, you know, with Tracy because I think we left that there. Uh, she probably doesn't know that yet. Uh, and uh, it was also discussed that for those developers who proposed uh, uh, creating affordable housing at 40% AMI or less, uh, they would get two and a half units uh, of to market rate units for each unit that is at 40% AMI or less. The one area that I had a question about that I wanted to develop with the board tonight dealt with the issue we talked about, about 40% uh, 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 bonus density. Uh, in certain zones, and I know that this was something that uh, Trustee Bazemore was talking a lot about. There are three zones in the village currently that have uh, specific density language in them. Uh, the CDD, which is the, uh, uh, the, the Conservation Development District, uh, has it. The, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Plant Waterfront Zones A, B, and C uh, as well as the uh, IR, the Institutional Redevelopment District. Uh, those density bonuses in those districts, the density bonuses that are referenced in the zoning code are not related to affordable housing. They are for certain amenities that are provided by the developer. Uh, those amenities include connection to the Riverwalk, public open space, historic preservation, green building construction, brownfield remediation, non-site related infrastructure work, uh, public artwork or steam bank or, or stream bank rather restoration. Uh, all of those, these three particular uh, areas also provide that the affordable housing requirements must be met if you're going to building, be building residential in those zones. Interestingly enough, there is one other zone that while not, uh, does not have the density bonus, it does have some similar language and that's uh, uh, the rarely mentioned Riverfront Development District, uh, which has also a planned waterfront and railway development overlay. I mention that because in that particular overlay zone, it, it provides for 10% affordable, but the affordable ha can be up, can, can be last for just 25 years, which is in fact different than what we have in our affordable housing, which has it that it is in perpetuity. So the, there is a, there's, there's something uh, that, that, that is off there. Uh, one other thing that I was mentioned last time that Trustee Basemore mentioned, you wanted, you wanted specific language in terms of the affordable housing fund. Uh, we actually do have language now that there is an affordable housing fund that the money should go either for affordable housing or for rehab. Uh, the actual amount, the fee, is something that would be subject to revision each year. So we can highlight it more in it, but there's actually language. It's in section 62-3 currently. But my, my issue was with regard to the, the 40%, uh, and, I, and I mention this because for each of the density bonuses that I have mentioned in the CDD, PW, A, B, and C, and in the IR zone, uh, the, the planning board, if it deems it appropriate, can award a 10% density bonus for each one of those particular bonuses that are referenced, of what each one of those amenities. Uh, however, the code provides for each one of these zones that the, the bonuses shall not exceed the maximum number of dwelling units that are provided in the bulk. So, in other words, that automatically locks it into that particular number. Uh, 
Uh, so what's important is when we look at the zoning code and we look at affordable, we need to have that, we, we, we can't have an inconsistency with the two. So I just wanted to come back to the board tonight because on the issue of the 40 percent and what we're going to do in those three particular zones, uh, and I know one of the points that was made is that those are zones that actually have a, a special, special permits. Actually, CDD does not have a special permit. PWA, B, and C does. IR does as well. Uh, and as does the, uh, the, the Riverfront District for the overlay zone. Uh, but I'm coming back to the board more on the issue of, of, of how to work this 40 percent, because if we're going, if, if, so, if someone in the CDD zone is going to come before the planning board with a proposal, and they're going to, let's say, connect to Riverwalk, they're going to do a green building, and they're going to do historic preservation. That would give them potentially 30 percent additional density bonuses. Now, they also have to provide 10 percent affordable housing as it is now under the code. Uh, where I'm having difficulty is that if you also then were to give a 40 percent density bonus, you're then going to be uh, beyond the bulk requirement that you have because the code under the zoning is clear that you can't go beyond, it's, you can't basically change the bulk requirement in those three particular zones. Uh, that, would, that would require a, a zoning text amendment because, uh, because that, that, that's what's in our code right now. So I just want to be able to, you know, to have that sort of discussion with, with, with the board tonight because uh, the other issues that have been raised, uh, putting parking aside, uh, can be, you know, I've actually started drafting, uh, you know, revisions to, to, to uh, the, the prior Local Law 3, which I'll, you know, I'll get around, but I, I know that the 40 percent was a big issue, so I just wanted to have a discussion with the board members as to really what to do with that 40 percent, because it would apply only within these three zones, but my concern is that if we do, if we put that in, either in the affordable housing or in zoning, it most likely would be in affordable housing and then referred back to zoning, if you take those 40 percent plus what could potentially be offered by a developer, uh, you're then going to be in a situation of having well beyond the av available dwelling units that the person can put in. So I'm just, I, I just wanted to bring that up to you because I think that creates a problem. So. Please. So, so what you're saying is that for these different zones, there, there's a maximum, there's a cap on, on the maximum number of units that could be developed within a certain area or within a certain lot size or because it sounds like we're, we're, we're going to cap out is what you're saying. If you, that, if, you that, add up, if you add up all the density bonuses that are provided in the three or four things that you listed that were 10 percent each right. and then and now we're talking about this this 40 percent thing that that we'd be, we'd, we'd be, there's too many units. It's beyond the, 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 the maximum number of units to build in that area, in that particular zone. It, it, well, it's with, well, it's with regard to the particular development within that zone. So uh, what, it, what it provides here is the planning board, and this is the same language for each, the planning board shall grant a density bonus of 10 percent for each amenity offered, provided that the planning board finds that the amenity is proportional to such density bonus. Notwithstanding the foregoing, such bonuses shall not exceed the maximum number of dwelling units specified in Appendix B, which is, our, which is the bulk requirements here. So you can't, that sort of caps it. So if you, so, so it, it, let me just point it to you this way. If someone, if some developer were to come in and do all uh, eight or nine of these uh, amenities, Theoretically, they could get 80 percent, but it would never happen because by adding that up, they would be beyond, they'd be beyond what's allowed under, under the bulk requirement. So my thought, uh, Trustee Cobb, as you're getting at is if we added the 40 percent in for these three zones, we're almost making it that there's no reason for uh, a developer to do any of these other amenities. And some of these are amenities which would are benefit to the public, you know, as I said, either connecting to the Riverwalk, open space, historic preservation, green building, brownfield, non-site related infrastructure, artwork, or stream bank restoration. Uh, if, if you're giving him the 40, he's probably going to say, well, uh, you know, 
but but i should point out that they're supposed to provide at least something like this so well the other the other part of it too is we could prioritize you know which of these things are more important i mean obviously you've got you've got all those three things that are or there are apparently there's a list of eight of them where right. they, they can i mean you, you, we could prior we could make it so that um, affordable housing is at the top of the list and if if that captures you know a large portion of the top end then then the other things would be you know diminished that's that's conceivable because I should point out that uh, an applicant does not have to apply for those density bonuses they can make a decision I don't want to provide any of these nine you know I'm just gonna do it that way but then the question is, and this goes back, I think, to something that the mayor was talking about in terms of it being a density bonus. Uh, are we, is, the, is the issue then that in these three particular zones, what we're saying to a developer is that you're getting, you, 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 you get 40 percent, do you get 40, but what is he getting for his 40 percent? In other words, uh, and I think that's sort of the, the question here. When I was trying to work the calculations out, I could do it with if it's more than 51 units, it's a 20% set aside of 50% AMI. But the, I, I had difficulty understanding where the 40% would come in if someone is deciding to build in the CDD or in the PW, A, B, or C. Where that 40% come, in other words, where, where does he get that 40%? What is he getting that 40%? Is it 40% above, he just gets the 40% or he has to build 40%? Uh, that, that's where I was having some difficulty in sort of understanding and and that's why I, when I looked at the zoning code I was I, I had the concern that you know we might be not, not running afoul of it but we might be creating problems with the zoning code so that's that, that that's the issues I had as related just to the 40 percent number so um, I like the, the idea of, of prioritizing um, but I, I guess in, in your explanation you also mentioned um, you know, if we were to go with it as it is written, or as we're proposing, that there would have to be a, a zoning text amendment. Was that was that a solution, or like, what did you just explain that to me? Well, currently now, if you were to, a couple of things. The, in the code for these three zones, they're called density bonus incentives. Mm -hmm. and this, this incentive word is specifically in there. I think the 40% was not viewed as an incentive. I, the impression I got, maybe I'm wrong, was that if someone's building in that zone, he's, you know, he can basically build up to 40%. He can get 40% more units mm -hmm. in that particular zone. Uh, that by itself would not require a zoning text amendment. But what would, what would require a zoning text amendment is if someone decided was to get the 40 but also was to do some of these incentives which perhaps the planning board may actually ask the person to do which is conceivable uh, hidden cove is a prime example of that where that has come in uh, you know he's then in a situation where he's being asked to do something but there's no incentive for him to do it because he's already reached the max number because what we do have in the zoning code, which is very clear, is that planning cannot allow it to go beyond what is in the bulk requirement. That's that, so they couldn't even seek a, a, a variance from, from the zoning board. Uh, they're not permitted to. So uh, again, these are specifically, you know, density bonus incentives. I, I'm not certain the way we talked about the 40% previously and specifically on the 25th, whether that's an incentive or is that simply because I'm building in that zone, uh, I'm able to basically build 40% more units? Uh, I, I'm not sure of that because I, there's no. So if it's not an incentive, then what does that look like? Well, if, if, you're, not gonna, if you're not putting the 40% in, it goes no. back to what we had. No. If you, you want to have the 40%? So if I'm saying I yeah. want the 40%, but it's not a quote unquote incentive as in the. Well, well, I guess the question then would be what is the 40%? Is it that you're saying to the developer, if you build in the CDD zone, where we will allow you to build 40% more units? Is that, uh, I, I, that, that's where I guess I'm sort of having the, 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 the if, if that's what you're saying, it, in other words, that in those particular zones, the developer has the ability to build 40% more. Uh, to be honest, you might want to just change your bulk requirement. I mean, because uh, I'm not sure what the 40 percent, I, I don't know what the 40 percent does other than potentially give you more units. Mm. Uh, but more units, all the 
will rise together. Yeah, with it, well, and with all, but, it's, but we're all talking right. those three particular zones. And of those 40%, obviously, the thought then is of those 40%, because if it's 50 or more units, it's going to be 20% are going to be set aside. You're going to have 20%, you know, you're going to have more three bedrooms because you're going to demand the three bedrooms be built. Uh, uh, but th I, I guess what you're saying, I guess the point is the incentive is that I'm being, I'm allowing you to build 40% more. Uh -huh. But the, but the difference is, is that the way it's viewed in the, in the zoning code is these are incentives which are public amenities. Uh, and that public amenity incentive is a little bit different than we're just building more housing. Mm. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong in building more housing. Mm. I'm just saying we may want to look at it differently. Uh, uh, currently, we don't distinguish between zones in terms of affordable housing. Mm. We just basically, in any zone you build in, be it the NC zone or be it the, you know, wherever you can, the, the MF zone, uh, you essentially get, uh, you'll, you under the proposal, you'd get 20% for anything 51 or greater, and under that you would get 10%, but everything would be based at a 50% AMI. Uh, that's, that's across the board. If this board wanted to say that in, for example, PW, A, B, and C, you wanted to allow the, in, the, the developer uh, to, to build more units, uh, uh, I, you could do that. Uh, it just, as I said, has to be consistent. You just don't want it to be inconsistent with zoning because in each of these, each of these sections, the reference is, is that the affordable, ha that it must match the affordable housing law that's set forth in Chapter 62. Oh. So the two have to, the two have to be married in some way. Uh, that, that, I'm just bringing that up because I, the only area where I had a lot of difficulty was the 40% because I didn't know where that would fit in, particularly given what we have for these, specifically for these three zones, because these are the only three zones where the density bonus incentive exists. It doesn't exist anywhere else in the village. So. Yeah, yeah, so no, I just thought, so at this point, really, our discussion is to learn more or discuss whether or not to go with the zoning text amendment or a bulk or a bulk requirement increase, right? Well, e either would require a text amendment okay. because the because the bulk because the bulk is part of the zoning code. Okay. So that would also then require uh, a, a text change uh, if you if you wanted to essentially uh, if you wanted to make a change to the zoning code, uh, except for you know minor you know changes, but changes like this, uh, that would be a text change to the zoning code. Okay. So, so can you just, uh, so how would that look if we say, hey, we're going to, we're going to do a zoning text amendment, what, what would that look like? So, well, well. So, the, for example, uh, let, let, let me, ahead, sure, so um, I'm, I'm thinking of P, W, A, C, and B, right, there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a 22 units per acre for the special permit, right, and so if we're, Again, if we're saying, you know, for affordable housing, we're giving a 40% bonus density, um, that would look like 30.8 30 30 units per, per acre instead of 22. So would we have to do a zoning text amendment for that or? Give me one second. Let me just look something up. To make sure that it fits, that they're allowed to do that. The the maximum in the PW, A, B, and C, the maximum density currently allowed with a special permit mm. to be granted by this board mm. uh, is 32 units per acre. Mm. Now, again, what that means is that your 40% effectively, as a, as a, using the code right now, mm. wipes out all the incentive for the other public amenity bonuses that exist in the code. So either you have to change your density number or you have to, or potentially cut back the 40 or some other way because uh, the, you, as you said, you're at 31, 30.8, mm. so you figure you're 31. Mm. You're maxed, you, you max out at 32. Mm. So, uh, and you also, as I said, you have it in the code that 
the planning board cannot go beyond what the number is. So you're effectively giving the planning board the ability to just add one more unit. Uh, and that, you know, for, from a developer's perspective, he's, you so, know. So if I, like, so for like a, a statue, <laughs> like if I say, hey, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't want that to be a public amenity anymore, uh, could I just change the zoning for that? Because, like, whether I have a statue or not is, is not crucially important to me at all. That's me personally, but is, is well, it's one of the it's it's one of the nine eight or nine factors that are mm -hmm. considered in those zones for granting increases. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, although it's ten percent for each one, it doesn't have to be ten percent. The board could think, well, it's nice, but I'm not giving you ten. Maybe mm -hmm. you know, you have eight. Per but uh, that's a decision that the board, this board, would have to make if they thought that some of those considerations would have to come out. Those, uh, as I said, those go across all the different. Uh, uh, all the different zones that have uh, those kind of densities. Uh, and again, it should be pointed out that to get to the 32 units in the PWA, B, and C, uh, that requires uh, a granting of a special permit by this board, uh -huh. uh, which is in fact what is currently, the, that's the Hidden Cove application that was recently made. Uh, because if you don't get that granted, they're limited to 15 units. Gotcha. And um, if we wanted to change that 32 number, like if we wanted to say, hey, you know, we don't have to stop there because we're, we're trying to incentivize affordable housing, could we do that? Through a code, through a text amendment. Okay. You'd have to, you'd have to do a text amendment. So if we wanted to say, hey, you know what, we like some of the incentives and we like some of the public incentives, but because we're doing affordable housing and we really want to incentivize this by offering bonus densities, we could, in fact, do a text amendment in conjunction with this policy that would would cap it would, would end the cap at 32 units per so that there's more wiggle room well you probably board. want to put a number at the end so if i, if I want to say 40. Like, right but let me let me just ask this question uh, uh the the way it's worded currently is that the different types of incentives i mentioned uh, are are not required it's they, they they may apply for it would it be similar to the 40 percent in other words uh, if a developer wanted to come in and said, I don't, you know, I'm willing to do artwork, I'm willing to do green building, I'm willing to do historic preservation and brownfield remediation. I don't want to put, I'm not doing 40%. Listen, if they don't, they're still required by the code to Well, 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 no, that's my question uh -huh. then. Are we now, uh, be, well, then, <clears throat> then that's not, so the, the, the question then is, then there's a difference because are we requiring 40% in these? Is that what the board is saying? Are we requiring it or are we saying that if the developer wants to, he can get up to 40% if he builds certain affordable houses? Yeah. That's, I think that's a question that, I, you know, is not answered to me yet, so that's what I'm trying to figure so, out. So in my mind, I'm not, I'm not, in my mind, I'm saying you can have up to 40% if you choose to do that. So, so if I answer it that way, then what does that mean for you? Because you don't have to, I mean, you could... Well, what it would mean is, in other words, what it comes down to is that where they list the different bonus incentives, mm -hmm. one of the bonus incentives, and perhaps following what Trustee Codman said, mm -hmm. to be viewed on a scale in terms of which is, yeah. you know, preferable more than mm -hmm. another, Priority. could be housing. Mm -hmm. And you may get a certain, and it could say that, well, each of these is worth 10%, housing, depending on what kind of housing you put up and how much, you could get up to, let's say, 40 percent. Mm. And if you do that, then perhaps your bonus density can be commensurately be raised. Mm. I mean, that's, but that would all be, that would require text amendments here and also to make sure that you have it under 62, which is your affordable housing. But that's one possibility, is that what you do is, you, in addition to listing all these, you could list a, a, a housing you know, an additional housing benefit. Uh -huh. uh, uh, either if he wants, to, if, if the developer just wants to stay at 20%, uh -huh. they're, they're welcome to. But if they want to go beyond that, uh, that's one of the things that could be considered. And, and I guess we, you could consider perhaps a type of sliding scale, depending on how many units are put in. Uh -huh. uh, that could increase, you know, the amount of density that you're willing to go, now, or, now, or in terms of what you're Now, so is. if we do it that way, though, 
the still the, the max number would still be 32. Is that what you're saying? Well, right now it is. Uh -huh. Right now it is. You, the only way to lift that cap is to uh -huh. change the bulk requirement. Okay. You'd have to change the bulk requirement because otherwise you're 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 limited to uh, to 32 in the PW, A, B, and C. Okay. Yes. And I think CDD is the same, if I'm not mistaken. So that yeah that that would have that would have to be uh, that would have to be lifted for that. That's correct. All right, so I, I like the idea of, of prioritizing. Um, I'm just speaking for myself and, co and colleagues. Please, please weigh in. But I also think that um, you know when you are, I'm of the mind that when you're incentivizing something, that if like if we went from 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 32 to 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 36, right? Like I'm, I'm or 40, I wouldn't have an issue also changing the bulk requirements for those particular zones. But um, I do like the idea of prioritizing. So, because like, a, again, for me, a, a statue, um, a river walk is, is great. Um, a statue, to me personally, is not my top priority. Priority is affordable housing. So. Um, hey, just, just if I can, the trustee Basemore. In the CDD district, mm -hmm. which would encompass uh, the area that is subject to the proposed mm -hmm. text amendment uh, that's prevent the baseline density there is six units per acre up to eight dwelling units per acre so there to get the higher numbers mm -hmm. that you know Snowden Woods has talked about would require they're using the different densities based upon on the code mm -hmm. so but th this board can prioritize it if it thinks it's appropriate but again you know, you, you, you're, you, right now you're limited to what your density bonus is, so you'd have to deal with that. Plus, if you wanted to, you know, add something in here, prioritize, it would, it would, that would be more a text change that would appear in the zoning code and then can be referred back to affordable housing. Okay. Do you have any comments or questions? No. No? No, I mean, I, I'm, it's a circular conversation that we've been having for 15 or 20 minutes. So for me, it's clear, um, and I don't like prioritizing because I think it's another way to handcuff um, the EAC and all these other boards that <laughs> sat here and talked about um, exactly this topic. So for me, it's, it's been exhausted. So I'm not sure. Um, how to get out of this circular conversation. So that's my commentary. Okay, so um, I just, I'm looking at the zoning map right now for folks at home who may not have pulled out their village zoning map. It, it appears to me that all of the districts that you're talking about are west of Route 9, which Correct. means they're all going to be subject to the LWRP. Yeah. So as you mentioned, the EAC, they would be looking yes. at the environmental impact for right. all of them. Now, the, you know, uh, Trustee Bazemore referenced that one of the potential um, one of the things on the list is, is uh, public art. Most of the things on the list, and, and I'm not looking at the list, but it sounded like uh, they were um, often environmentally related. Yes. Um, and so, so prioritize, I mean, obviously the LDR, uh, LWRP was put in place years ago and was updated again um, a few years later. Um, and so it, it, that's a bigger conversation if we're, if we're saying that we're going to discount the existing environmental incentives. Um, but I think what, what we've done tonight is we've heard from a legal perspective what are some of the concerns with the currently suggested changes to the local law three um, and how that may not fit in our existing parameters for um, these particular districts um, from a legal perspective. Uh, what, what we haven't done is talk to our planner yet about any of these, uh, about any of these suggestions and how Local Law 3 um, would uh, work well or um, uh, might cause us to rethink some of what we have in our comprehensive plan and, and some necessary updates, um, whether it's something as simple as a text amendment uh, to our zoning regulation or if there needs to be a deeper dive and, and, and some actual changes to the comprehensive plan if, if in some cases we were inconsistent with the existing comprehensive plan. So um, 
our September 12th meeting uh, agenda already is super long. We're going to have to take another look at that and see if there's some things that are not um, urgent. Uh, and I can't even off the top of my head remember everything that's on there, but one of the things I know is on there is that um, Tracy Corbett, our relatively new planner still, um, is planning to join us. Um, I won't put her on the spot tonight even though she's listening in and she's observed a couple of our meetings now and is getting, I'm sure, increasingly more familiar with our, our um, all of our comprehensive plan and zoning regulations that we're discussing tonight. Um, we'd already asked her to come in and um, help us understand uh, a moratorium. Um, help us understand what it would look like to open up our comp plan. Um, and I think specifically it might be helpful if we were able to uh, delve into, uh, from a planning perspective, some of what we're talking tonight when we're talking about um, bulk requirements and we're talking about um, everything that has come up tonight related to potential changes in local law three, which is our affordable housing policy. And what does that look like, not just from a legal process perspective or a, a legal, um, you know, uh, potential violation or, or, or conflict. Not, the legal stuff is super important. We always need to follow that. Oh, no, oh, no. But I'd like to understand from a, um, a uh, planning perspective, what does that really mean and help us put it into context. So uh, Tracy's nodding and, and, and Debbie was nodding. So is that something that, I, that, does that make sense to everyone that we include that as part of our conversation in what will be our next work session in two weeks? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. I just had some, um, so I just wanted to, Thanks, Stuart, because this is kind of an update as to where we are, and the public was kind of asking where we are on this mm -hmm. conversation, and it's going to be a, obviously an ongoing conversation. So, um, I, you know, I do think that you provided your legal concerns, but you also provided two perspective solutions, right? Whether it's the conversation of a zoning text amendment, which seems like it would have to be done regardless of what we change and how we change it, or a bulk requirement increase. So, it's definitely very important to, you know, to have that discussion to really learn. Um, what the concerns are and also what the options are. So thank you for your time. Uh, I really appreciate that. And as far as um, what Deputy Mayor Codman said, um, when it comes to lives, because this, this is what it is, right? Affordable housing and quality of housing, um, you know, prioritization um, is, is very much um, a sensible approach, um, um, especially when it, when it comes to um, what we choose to build or allowed to build or encouraged to build. Um, and um, this board started the year off with making housing a priority. And so, and we even asked our manager to do a priorities list. So it's, it's already how we're operating. So I just wanted to point that out, but thank you. The um, other thing for the agendas is um, the committees that we have, we have a dozen committees, and some of them I think are obligated, I know the EAC is by bylaws to report to the board at a certain time. So I, I see the agendas are filling up, but with a, we should really be inviting the committees as well. I'm on a separate topic, I'm back on agendas, I mean, we're moving on, um, and in the initiatives that we're supposed to get updated on. So. Some of that has to be also fed into the agendas. And then we start, I guess, as most people that follow us, we start going into the budget process, right? Which, yeah. which is why I'd like to hear the citizen committees um, report to the board and somehow fit on the agendas because some of them may have budget um, requests as well. And, um, you know, I'd like to hear from them where they are and what they need and where they're going um, to cover the many issues, because the initiatives cover more than just affordable housing. They cover a whole bunch of different issues um, that we relate to. So I'm just saying publicly that since some of them might be listening, we're supposed to take the time to also get the reports from the different uh, boards that we have. Right. So I just appreciate looking into that as well. Absolutely. Both of you. Yeah. I, I echo that. There's plenty of committees and um, I have liaison reports as well, so that, that could also be yeah. put into that one. Um, yeah. And I, have, I at least have no problem going into it at a legislative session if our work session agendas are too much. Did we cover uh, all of your concerns, at least for this evening, to be I'm not sure further discussed an in two more weeks? <laughs> At least for this evening, yes. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Is there anything else you wanted to fill us in on or make sure that we're aware of tonight? Um, no, I don't think so. I think you're up to speed on everything. So. Uh, yeah. Do we need to have executive session or advice, uh, executive session tonight or anything? I don't think well, so. We don't. I just no. want to just say one quick thing about Please. the Landlord Tenant Council. They have been very busy. 
uh, I, I, all the emails for LTRC at Village of Austin come to me, uh, and I promptly send them out to our chair and vice chair, and as well as our, to our uh, uh, two trustee liaisons and to the deputy corporation council. We've been getting a lot in, uh, and uh, uh, tenants are very interested because they follow up. Their tenants are sending me photographs. They're sending me videos. Uh, so uh, it's it's a very active group. And uh, so, and I just think it's important because we do get this question a lot. The form is online. It can be filled out online. Uh, you get it to me and it, as to LTRC at villageofaustining.org, and it gets sent out to the committee promptly. Uh, if they need to meet earlier than their regular scheduled meeting, they will. But uh, uh, they, you know, they, they, they have a very busy docket after, you know, only being around, not, you know, in its current iteration, not that long. But uh, you know, I get two. I'm getting you know two or three a month. Uh, so it's uh, you know, and what happens is particularly in certain buildings uh, where there there have been issues, one tenant talks to another, and they actually post in some of these buildings. You know, you can send your complaints to this place, uh, and uh, <laughs> so we we get those, and we also get questions about you know you know rent that's overdue and things like that. But uh, they're they're doing a very good job, and they are busy. So uh, you know, I just want people to be aware that that uh, committee is there, and it is uh, it's very active. Thank you. And and actually, the landlord tenant relations council is one of the giving us an update and coming to speak to us on the twelfth yeah. is one of the yeah. topics that I know is on the tentative agenda. Right. So it sounds like they'll have a lot to tell us about. Looking forward to that. I'm only going to make one plug here for the EAC because we still need. To order that work out. No, we are at the bare quorum, so we, right. need, we, we need, need members. People who are interested in the environment and um, have any backgrounds uh, related to environmental studies, um, you know, we should put more qualifications. I don't want to wait. I mean, we're getting close to not having a quorum if one person is out with the flu. So if anybody um, is looking at the resume, they're able to apply things through the website, yes? They can apply online. And we get them right away, and if there's an opening, then we process them right away. And mm -hmm. actually, um, we had talked about approaching, and I'm glad this came up because it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a, a good opportunity for anybody who's still watching our meeting. Um, we talked about, uh, because we have about a dozen mm -hmm. um, boards and committees, and um, most of them uh, have terms that end at the end of the year, mm -hmm. and um, so we'll, we'll start to know where there's going to be vacancies, even when there aren't. There are existing vacancies in the case of the EAC, but we know that there are some other ones that may, um, folks may, their term may be ending at the end of the year, and so we know we're going to have even more vacancies, and that will be the case on a number of boards and committees, and I believe our plan was in <coughs> September to let everybody in the public know we've got vacancies on X, Y, and Z committee. Please submit your information, your interest, yes. and we're going to do our um, try and concentrate as much as possible on uh, all of the uh, interviews with uh, candidates this fall so that the appoints, right. appointments can be ready to go January 1st. Right. I'm and only smiling because as you were talking, I realized next week is September. It is. September, right. And I'm fully depressed. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I can tell you that we're already putting the announcement together, um, and so when Jamie comes back on Friday, uh, we won't do it then, but the following week we'll be working on getting that posted and out so that there is a lot of opportunities out there for our, our residents to, to get involved and volunteer. Excellent. Is, mm -hmm. wow, is there a way, um, and I'll be more than happy to volunteer some time to this, for us to have, like, some sort of like small little expo where we have every single committee or commission um, to just meet its leaders, its members, um, you know, possibly also have an interpreter, um, you know, outlining like what we offer instead of just doing it business as usual, send an application, we'll get who we get and that's it. Um, I don't even know if we have enough time for that, by the way, I'm thinking out loud. Um, well, one but, of the things we've talked about is inviting them to a meeting to mm -hmm. publicly thank them, and that would be an opportunity for folks to learn more about them. Sure. But but did you have some other thoughts on how we might be able to well, I think no, I mean, that entice people? Like we have not advertised these openings in the past. So this year we really want to get out there and advertise it in a lot of different ways on our website and through the Web Blast and 
um, mayor's monthly meeting and, and however all of you want to share that through Facebook just to really blast out the information that we really are looking for new volunteers and, and here's where you can go and get it. So we're hoping that that outreach will really bring us a lot more interest. I'm We've just, just never done it before. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, we did. Um, last year we started um, real interview processes where two trustees had to be there. We put it out on social media. We did actual job descriptions. I, I mean, I beg to differ. We have a greater ability because our website is now much more operational, but I would say that actually there was a lot um, for the first time, we did send out letters to people who for years had the same position. Okay. So I don't think it's business as usual until about a year ago. Uh, there started to be a much more professional um, approach to that's how the EAC was filled and that's why the people who sit for the first time in a decade and that's why they take minutes now and we professionalized the meetings and that's why the community center board is more full and virtually every board. So I'm just going to say that it's it's a little misleading. I mean, we went through a lot of trouble, actually. I'd actually like to see that moved up a notch. And the idea of actually having presentations by the boards is part of that. Some of them, I think Jeff Smith said he didn't write minutes or anything for a decade is in, in the AC. And now they're like really s the staff and they and um, the landlord tenant committee that Quantel and I did a lot of work. And we did a lot of publicizing to get people on there. So I don't want the public to think that because, frankly, there was a lot of work put into it beyond there's a new business as usual. The new business as usual is a much more professional um, environment, and I'd like to actually move that forward. I think if you have an idea of how to do a conference type of thing, like here, with tables and, and, and invite people to see, I didn't know whether you meant the, um, people who might be interested in different committees because all not-for-profits do that. They, line up or if you're looking at a college, you'll have a college fair and all the colleges are there with a couple of representatives or if you so to get more committee members or for the public to know more about what committees do and who the people are so they can meet them. I didn't know which way you were going with that or both, well, but well, I, mean, as, as I, I thought said, that I, was very interesting. I was thinking out loud, so it, you know, oh. I don't have a formal proposal. I mean, okay. we, we could add that to an agenda too, um, but what I was discussing more was um, finding a way for us to go the village meeting, the residents where they're at, instead of them being, you know, I don't want us to force them to watch a meeting when we recognize them. You know, most people don't watch. I mean, we have a YouTube account that does okay, but when you really break down the stats, it doesn't really reach many people. And when you look at our Go TV stats, most people aren't watching these meetings, right? Some are, the ones that are, you know, the same 250 that are pretty attuned and involved. But um, I am challenging myself and the board just to find alternative ways for us to reach people that normally aren't reached out to. Um, and communities that normally wouldn't um, hear from us or committee members. Um, so that's kind of what I was saying. Um, I, I think that we also need to have a evaluation as to um, what committees exist and also what committees don't exist, what purposes, you know, what is our need. Um, so I do agree that um, I, I have heard that as far as minutes, and account, um, which helps with accountability as far as operations and committees have improved. Um, but it's still a lot of a work in progress. So it wasn't my intention to downplay any of, of your hard work. Um, but I wasn't on to you. I was on to you. <laughs> uh, uh, or, or, or to Debbie. I mean, neither was or to I. Debbie. Is, is um, no one listening um, tonight? Seriously. But, but, no, no, but I just, you know, um, because it is still hard work, right, from the village. Um, but we, 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 um, we do have a long way to go since there are numerous um, and a major population in our community and segments that are not connected with us at all. Um, so that's kind of what you, you know, you'll hear me saying going forward, not just when it comes to committees, but just how we operate as a whole. Could you um, just, you know me, like totally into solution-driven environments, um, could you ask Jamie how we can create like YouTube, seg YouTube segments because they can be translated into other languages through YouTube um, so that chairs can sit down, talk about what they do, what their committee does, and with a staff person, put it out on YouTube. There are clips, a couple of minutes each, we can give scripts. And until we have the ability to have something in the community center, that would speak to where people are. Um, now, it's work. We didn't think about, like, what do we need? I don't know, you know, if, like, Tom and company could do it. But if you could look into that, because, I mean, look, you've got 12 major initiatives, big picture, little picture, infrastructure, roads, blah, you know, things that happen. So if we can maybe add that somewhere as you think about the next 12 to 18 months, 
Um, you know, I, I mean, I could help with that. Anybody with an iPhone can create those, but, and I don't want to overload staff who's loaded. I'm just suggesting as a solution to being where people are, create these vignettes and just put them out there, and that well, might be helpful. GoTV has offered to do those things for right. us, and now that they have a studio set up right here at the yeah. community yeah. center, uh, they could set up, we could talk to uh, Sue Donnelly and ask her if she would do those series, and Great. she could get that set up and, and do some quick three to five minute you know, blurbs. Would you tell Sue that I would be happy to take time off from my full-time job, which I do this for <laughs> as well, um, if we want to set mm -hmm. up times with different chairs um, to create the scripts and so that there's, you know, who, what, where, and when, so there's some consistency. Um, and just ask her if her stuff, I mean, I, I, you don't have to do that. I can actually call her separately, but so that we can just move forward on this and not make it very complicated. That would be sure. great. Thanks. Great. Well, that was very, uh, as you say, solution-oriented. I'm pretty pleased that we, we uh, came up with some ideas of how to perhaps reach out to more people. And, uh, Rika, I'm glad that you did remind uh, folks of the um, great progress that was made last year. And it sounds like we can make even greater progress this year because there, there was actually a moment in time where every board and committee was full. And, uh, and that was very much the first time that that had happened, I think, since any of us had been in elected office. And it was something uh, really updating the code. We changed village code so that we would uh, invite more people to be participants um, on committees that hadn't had a lot of turnover in the years. And we also um, uh, codified uh, more of the training for a number of the folks uh, so that they could just be that much better informed and make that, especially the folks who are uh, really interpreting village code and, and making uh, decisions that are going to, or recommendations that are going to have lasting impact. So um, there has been a lot of progress on that front, and, and we can certainly always do more to try and reach some more people, and this is the season to do it. Sir? Just last, Mayor, uh, for next week, uh, uh, just as the board knows, uh, it is looking to be a very heavy agenda. We have three public hearings. Uh, we have the dog uh, tethering. Yeah. We have the code, the, the code uh, provisions. Uh, oh my gosh! And we have uh, the, the the ETPA. Uh, I do want, just so folks know, we are making arrangements to have a Spanish interpreter for next week's Amen. for the public Amen. hearing. Uh, so uh, uh, we'll have someone here who will. Uh, we in, in, interpret. We're just trying to figure out the logistics of exactly yeah, how it's going to be done. Yeah. We don't have headphones, so so what we're looking at is whether the person will be speaking to a group to translate, or do we want the person simply to be able to translate for the individual who may come up? But we, I'm, I'm making arrangements to have a translator. Just uh, the, but we don't have the uh, uh, equipment like they have at the school, which is sort of the, the headphones and, and the sets like that. Uh, but uh, we're, we're, we're looking to do something. But, and we also have a request out to the Managers Association to sort of get the ideas of what other municipalities do in terms of translation well, we services. We had like two or three people volunteer last time. They didn't? Okay. I, I actually have someone who saw it and said she would be happy to, to do it. I didn't even, I thought great. there's so many people came up to you. I assumed that you had like no, a No, I list. gave out my cards and they okay. have not called me I'll back. I'll contact so. her. But anyway, as I said, because we, we have... We have the three. We have the three hearings next week, so it's going to be. Yeah, the three hearings. Um, if we do it in one language, is going to be a long night. So I, 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 it would be ideal if, for the people who are going to benefit from the from the interpreter, right. it would be ideal if uh, everything could be translated for them and for um, the purposes of keeping the movie the meeting moving. Um, if if we didn't do everything in one language and then everything in another language, and ever possible. Well, the thought might be, and, and Debbie and I can work this out operationally, it may be we have an area where if folks need a translator, someone can be back there and can essentially be doing translation services, something like that. Uh, you know, uh, but uh, as I said, because we don't have the equipment to, you know, with, with the headphones like they do have at the, uh, the OHS library. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll have something worked out. My thought was primarily to have the translator for the uh, ETPA discussion. If you wanted, uh, per, if you wanted for the entire meeting, I can certainly arrange the person to do that. But it was primarily for the ETPA because I thought that that was, you know, more where we would we would have more folks who may well be interested and want to say something or at least see what's going on. But the arrangements will be made to have an interpreter that evening. We'll work out the logistics. Have we asked the schools to if we could borrow their headsets? For this I don't meeting? know if that inquiry has been made so I, I can you know Jamie's out uh, till Friday so we can make that inquiry and yeah. see. Uh, I mean they may have but, a meeting themselves because it's the 
we, we go back to school. I don't know if they have parent meetings or such. That's right. They, they are. Uh, well, I think their classes start Thursday, so they start the day yeah. after our meeting. So we'll, we'll make an inquiry and see. Uh, Stuart, um, yeah. because you brought up ETPA, um, my, my thought is that the, the board may uh, decide to keep the public hearing open or close it. Um, would it be possible for you to prepare a resolution in the case that the board chooses to close it? And there was a conversation about screen G from screen G from Chuck Lesnick. Would it be possible to have two resolutions just so that the board can decide whether or not they want to implement screen G at that time or whenever um, the public hearing actually uh, happens. Is that possible? Did you, did you understand? Oh, no. I, okay. I had a judge who once said, never ask a question if something is possible, because the answer is always yes. Uh, and he was right, and uh, the verdict showed it when I got it. But uh, uh, the answer is yes, the resolutions can be prepared. Uh, uh, you know, on the screen injury, I think it's important. I know Chuck was talking about that it's a fairly small number, but I think it's a number to, we, we need to have some idea what that number is in terms of what it could potentially be in terms of a tax, essentially a tax rebate back to that individual or what the village would be paying. So I think that's just to figure out, but in terms of the mechanics of having a resolution, there can be a resolution or resolutions prepared. That's, that's not an issue. Okay. Um, Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. <laughs> Next week, we will be at the courthouse on Spring Street. As we were just reminded, we have three public hearings beginning at 7.30. Um, eat a big, hearty dinner, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next week, September 5th, 7.30, our usual time back at the courthouse. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>